Hi guys, I just wanted to point out that I have added a bunch of options to the astronomy calculator. <clears throat> um, these three, the Kepler's third law functions are still there. The difference in magnitudes from flux ratio and flux ratio from magnitudes are still there. I've added another calculator to the small angle formula. So now there are three variables in the small angle formula and there are three calculators depending on which variable you need to solve for. Similar to the Kepler's third law, there's three variables in Kepler's third law and there's three calculators depending on which one you need to solve for. What I want to point out is that um, if you go through the, I, I basically went through all the math reference cards and found the ones that we're going to be using a lot. And for each of those I put necessary calculators. So for example um, the Doppler formula, speed from shift in wavelength and wavelength shift from speed are here. Blackbody radiation, now there are two blackbody radiation calculators to solve for the two variables in that formula. The powers of a telescope, there's the resolving power and the magnification of a telescope, two calculators there. There's um, luminosity, radius, and temperature. When we get to stars, we're going to find that to be useful. So here I've got three calculators. It's a three-variable formula, and here are three calculators to solve for those three variables, and so on. Um, there's one here called, let's see, a circular, what is it, circular velocity. Well, circular velocity turns out to be a consequence of two things. It's Kepler's third law, which gives you the period for mass and separation, and it's a simple formula about circular motion, speed of circular motion. So instead of putting another formula in for that, speed of circular motion, it turns out we can use a lot of different places. Um, I'm just going to encourage you to get the period from Kepler's third law, plug the period into this guy to get the velocity. So we don't really need another calculator for that one. And uh, anyway, that's the main point. All these calculators are here. They relate back to the math reference cards. There are some formulas that I think are so simple, like the Hubble law is just the velocity is Hubble constant times distance. I don't think I need a calculator for that one. Um, and <clears throat> let's see. I guess that's it. Um, there's, there's a couple other here. The age of the universe is a simple application of the Hubble law. The life expectancies of stars is uh, really just fuel divided by rate. Uh, I might add a calculator for that one, but as you can see, things are getting pretty full. And we don't really use this one that much. So um, I guess there may be a few more that get added to this guy before the, before the semester's over. But for now, I think we're actually pretty good. This is almost everything we're going to need for the, whole, for the whole course. Anyway, we'll see you guys. Hey guys, welcome back. I wanted to uh, say a couple things before we get started. First of all, the online homework four and five are now posted, so you can get started on those guys. I want to point out another thing. Well, first of all, before you click the take button to actually take these, I would recommend printing the assignment. Click the print blank assignment, and that'll allow you to look at all the questions and do a little research and you know practice if you like. Also, a number of students were not aware that I posted practice assignments. So for each chapter now, there's a practice assignment. So if you want to practice chapter four, you can click the practice button here, and it'll take you to uh, what's called a uh, self-study guide, basically, a self-study um, window. And for some reason, there it comes. So. Uh, in this case, there's there's a post test. The idea is to study and then take this uh, this post test to see how you're doing. And what it should show is one question at a time, which you can answer, and it'll give you feedback about how you're doing. So that way you can check to make sure you've got the concept understood before you uh, try the homework question. So you can even snoop through these and try to find ones that are similar to the homework. So for example, here's one about uh, scene. It shows you two images. This is right out of the textbook, actually. Uh, on a, it turns out when the atmosphere is turbulent, the scene is not good. Um, and if you just look through a normal telescope with no special uh, 
technology, you'll see a picture like this, but there's a thing called adaptive op optics, which basically measures the turbulence in the atmosphere and corrects for it, and produces an image that looks like this with much better scenes. So I would say the answer is uh, adaptive optics. So I'll enter my answer and then move ahead. And now it's saying uh, something about two different telescopes and comparing their light gathering power and so on. So uh, that's how that guy works. Let's um, let's go back. Let me actually pop over to the uh, slides. So uh, basically, the the slides for this uh, session are about two different things. There's a group of slides about light, and there's another group of slides about telescopes and the sun. So right now I want to talk about the characteristics of light. I call it the facts of light. Clever, huh? So the idea is, uh, first of all, what is light? Well, light is um, an electromagnetic disturbance that propagates through space. It has um, wave characteristics. So for example, um, wavelength, period, and frequency. Wavelength is, so if you've got a wave, think of a water wave or a sound wave or something like that. Um, you can imagine that it's going to have a distance between neighboring um, peaks and distance between neighboring troughs. That distance is called the wavelength. It's the distance you have to go in the wave to get to something that looks the same as it was before. Then uh, it turns out that light waves in a vacuum have a characteristic speed of 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. And they're produced by charges in atoms or charges that are free that are wiggling in some way. So let me let me pop back to a web page and I can show you I've cooked up a little animation here to try to illustrate the idea. So here I have a wave and notice that it's um, propagating to the right and I've placed a little bobble here. This could be like a charge or something that's wiggling for some reason and it's producing this electromagnetic wave. What I want to point out is as the wave propagates to the right the charge bobbles up and down and the time it takes for the charge to bobble once is also the time it takes for the wave to traverse a distance of one wavelength. So let me pause it here and let's look at that. So it starts here, it goes down and comes back up and in the time it took to wiggle one time, the wave went from here over to here. Now that distance is a wavelength. The time is a period. So you can see right away that the velocity, the distance it goes, divided by the time it takes to go that distance, is nothing other than the wavelength divided by the period. Okay? So if I go back to my slides here, um, I want you to notice that the wavelength divided by a period is the same thing as the wavelength times the frequency. Now how does that work? Well, the frequency is how many wiggles there are per second. The period is how many seconds is there in a wiggle. So if there are 10 wiggles in a second, that means each wiggle is a tenth of a second. So you can see that the frequency is 1 divided by the period. And that means 1 divided by the period is the same thing as the frequency. So the velocity is also the wavelength times the frequency. So if you knew the velocity of a wave, say in this case an electromagnetic wave in a vacuum, that would be the speed of light, and you knew the frequency of the wave, so many cycles per second, you could simply divide the velocity by the frequency to compute the wavelength. Similarly, if you knew the wavelength, I mean if you knew the yeah wavelength and the velocity, you could divide the velocity by the wavelength to get the frequency. Either way, if you know one of the guys and can get the other one, assuming you know the velocity. Now, in our case, we're dealing with electromagnetic waves. The velocity is always basically going to be the speed of light. So it's, it's actually not that bad. Now, light comes in a bunch of different flavors, a different wavelengths. Visible light goes between about uh, 0.4 microns to about 0.7 microns, as you can see in this slide. Uh, other units that are useful Microns are millionths of a meter. Nanometers are billionths of a meter, so that's also 400 nanometers up to 700 nanometers. But of course there are wavelengths outside the visible spectrum 
that are also important, infrared, microwave, radio, x-ray, and gamma ray. And you can see in this diagram all those different types of electromagnetic radiation, which they're all really the same thing, they just have different wavelengths, are shown here relative to the visible spectrum. Now, what defines the visible spectrum? It's just the physiology of the human eye. It's what the human eye can see. But you can see that there are lots of other wavelengths that um, are outside the human vision, but are still physically important. Now, as light propagates through uh, matter, some light is absorbed or scattered. And uh, that's important for us because we're looking out in the night sky, say, looking at stars and planets and comets and so on. And uh, the kind of electromagnetic radiation we can actually measure depends on the transparency of the atmosphere in all these different uh, wavelength regions. It turns out the atmosphere is fairly transparent in the visible spectrum, but it's practically opaque in other wavelengths, which I'll get to here in a second. Um, also, the uh, behavior of the source of light affects how the light appears. But let, let's look at the transparency of the atmosphere. You can see that um, in the visible spectrum, the uh, light gets all the way down to the Earth. It's very transparent, uh, with very little attenuation, very little absorption. Also, in the radio wavelengths down here, uh, we do pretty well. But in between, in the infrared and, and it, higher frequencies or shorter wavelengths than visible, things are not so good. So if you want to look at ultraviolet light or you want to look at infrared light, you pretty much need to put a telescope in orbit around the Earth in order to see that. Then the other thing I wanted to point out is that objects with different temperatures produce spectra with different wavelengths. Uh, so here we see a very hot object and this is looking at energy as a function of wavelength being produced by this object. You'll notice that the peak wavelength happens in the blue. This object is at 7,000 Kelvin, which is much hotter than the surface of, of our own sun. A cooler object, around 6,000, this is about the temperature of our sun, has its peak wavelength in the green. Um, and a much cooler object at 5,000 Kelvin, cooler than our sun, has its peak wavelength in the red. So when you warm your toaster up, say, to make your toast, you'll notice it has uh, the coils get sort of red hot. So you would guess that they're going to be in the neighborhood of four or 5,000 Kelvin. Now, Kelvin is a, a temperature scale that has a zero at absolute zero. It's similar to the Celsius scale, except the zero is absolute zero instead of the freezing point of, of water. Okay. The other thing I want to point out with this uh, diagram is that the hotter objects produce much more energy. The cooler objects have much less energy. So you can actually uh, quantify these two facts. The one fact is that as an object becomes hotter, the wavelength of peak emission goes into shorter and shorter wavelengths, more and more blue. We're going to find out later that bluer wavelengths correspond to higher energy particles of light and longer wavelengths correspond to lower energy particles of light. So that kind of makes sense. Um, that fact is uh, made quantified, or it's quantifiable, through this thing called Wien's Law, or some people say Wien's Law. Um, it's W-E-I-N, I think. Um, but the law goes like this. If you multiply the peak wavelength times the temperature, you get a constant. Okay, and Actually, I'm going to pop back over to my web browser here for a second. And I'm going to, uh, let's see, now where am I going to do this? Oh, I know. It's going to be here. This is the astronomy calculator. I want to point out um, there's two black body formulas here. Wavelength from temperature, temperature from wavelength. So if you have a problem where, say, you're given a temperature and you want to know the wavelength, you can use this guy. It does all the math for you. So let's look at 7,000 Kelvin, just like in the example. It gives me a peak wavelength of 413 nanometers. That's barely in the visible spectrum. If I go to 8,000 Kelvin, now I'm in 362. That's in the ultraviolet, so that's not even visible. On the other hand, if I went to 4,000 Kelvin, 
I'm looking at 724. That's outside the visible spectrum. It's very red. Uh, some people might be able to see that. Most folks probably couldn't. So that works out to be about 965, clearly way outside, way outside the uh, visible spectrum. Anyway, then the other thing, of course, if you know the wavelength and you want to know the temperature, you can run it that way. So if you're at uh, 700 nanometers, boom, that means you're at 4,139.6 Kelvin. Anyway, this formula runs it backwards. So my uh, point is that if you if you uh, need to use that black body formula, you can use the astronomy calculator I cooked up and save yourself a lot of trouble working out units and all that stuff. Okay, so let's go back to the slide, see how we're doing. The other idea is that um, the brightness of an object has to do with both its temperature and its size. I'm going to focus on the temperature at the moment, but I want to point out again that the um, astronomy calculator that I cooked up has these guys. It's um, luminosity from size and temperature. So if you want to know the luminosity, you put in the temperature, you put in the size, and you get the luminosity. Now this is not in absolute units. What this means is, say for example, you wanted to know the luminosity of a star relative to the sun. And you know the star has twice the temperature of the sun, and it's also five times the size of the sun, then this tells you that that star is 400 times as luminous as the sun. On the other hand, if it's the same size as the sun and it has twice the temperature, it's going to be 16 times as luminous. Do you see how that works? Then, of course, this formula can also be used to get the size. If you know the luminosity and the temperature, it also lets you get the temperature if you know the luminosity and the size. So you can run this thing any old way. All right? OK. So then uh, what happens if a source is moving? Well, if a source is moving, it turns out um, if it's moving toward you, you hear a higher, uh, well, if it's a sound source, you hear a higher pitch sound if it's moving toward you and a lower pitch sound if it's moving away. If you've ever heard a a fire truck go by like something like that or uh, a trolley car maybe ringing a bell ding 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 something like that that's the Doppler effect um, it turns out the shift in the wavelength of the wave is proportional to the velocity divided by the speed of the wave times the original wavelength before it was shifted now this also works with light if you have a light source moving towards you the wavelengths of light get blue shifted or scrunched. If it's moving away, the wavelengths get stretched out or red shifted. But the formula is the same, it's just that the speed of the wave is the speed of light in this case. Okay, that's how that one works. Then the other one is um, light sometimes behaves like a wave, sometimes it behaves like a particle. A particle of light happens to be called a photon and a photon has an energy proportional to its frequency. The uh, proportionality constant is something called Planck's constant, and of course you know the frequency using the velocity formula we cooked up earlier is the speed of light divided by the wavelength, so you can also get the energy from, from that. So I don't currently have a formula on the astronomy calculator for that guy, but um, I believe, well, there's one at VCALC you could look up, you could search for, but uh, if we need one, I'll go ahead and add one. I don't remember. I don't think there's any homework dealing with that one, but um, I can certainly cook one of those guys up if you guys think that would be helpful. Okay, the other thing is when light is acting like a wave, as it does, um, and it passes through an, a circular opening, what you get on the other side is a diffraction um, spot. In other words, you don't just get a point of light, you actually get a spot of a definite size, and if you have two lights that are uh, two sources that are near one another, instead of seeing two definite spots, you'll see a merged together sort of splotchy looking thing like this. 
So a telescope, for example, has limits on its ability to resolve things based on its size. And there, of course, is a formula, as you might have guessed, that tells you the angle, the angular size of a spot that depends on the wavelength of the light and the diameter of the hole. In other words, for a telescope, the diameter of the hole that the light goes through. And um, in fact, people build telescopes that are joined together. These are typically radio telescopes to produce a effectively larger aperture to make this D bigger. And if D is bigger, of course, that makes the angle, the resolution angle, smaller. It means you can resolve things that are closer together. So the point is, if I have two sources in the sky separated by a small angle, this formula tells me whether I can distinguish them or not. If the resolution of the telescope is a smaller angle than the angular separation, then I'll be able to resolve it. If the angular resolution of the telescope is larger than the angular separation of the two objects in the sky, I won't be able to resolve it. Okay? That's the idea. So, um, finally, let's see if I can... Hmm. The, uh, the last bit, somehow my slide is not advancing. I'm not sure exactly why. The last thing I want to point out is that the turbulence in the atmosphere can affect the visibility of uh, objects in the sky. If the atmosphere is very turbulent, you end up with a blurry picture like this. If the atmosphere is very calm and clear, you get a picture that looks like this. And that idea is called scene. So if scene is good, you'll get a nice clear picture. If scene is bad, you'll get a very blurry picture. Okay? And that's really all I have right now. So um, I know we went through that rather quickly, but if you have questions, I do hope you'll uh, send me a note and ask. Take care.